STORY II. OF CHRISTMAS EVE AND CHRISTMAS DAY. TEN CHRISTMAS STORIES. BY EDWARD EVERETT HALE. THIS LIBRIVOX RECORDING IS IN THE PUBLIC DOMAIN. STORY II. CHRISTMAS WAITS IN BOSTON. PART One. I ALWAYS GIVE MYSELF A CHRISTMAS PRESENT, AND ON THIS PARTICULAR YEAR THE PRESENT WAS A CAROL PARTY which is about as good fun, all things consenting kindly, as a man can have. Many things must consent, as will appear. First of all, there must be good sleighing, and second, a fine night for Christmas Eve. Ours are not the carolings of your poor shivering little East Angles or South Mercians, where they have to plod round a foot in countries where they do not know what a sleigh ride is. I had asked Harry to have sixteen of the best voices in the chapel school to be trained to eight or ten good carols without knowing why. We did not care to disappoint them if a February thaw setting in on the 24th of December should break up the spree before it began. Then I had told Howland that he must reserve for me a span of good horses and a sleigh that I could pack sixteen small children into, tight stowed. Howland is always good about such things, knew what the sleigh was for, having done the same in other years, and doubled the span of horses of his own accord, because the children would like it better, and it would be no difference to him. Sunday night, as the weather nymphs ordered, the wind hauled round to the northwest, and everything froze hard. Monday night, things moderated, and the snow began to fall steadily. So steadily! and so tuesday night the metropolitan people gave up their unequal contest all good men and angels rejoicing at their discomfiture and only a few of the people in the very lowest bulgy being ill-natured enough to grieve and thus it was that by thursday evening was one hard compact roadway from copse hill to the bone burners gehenna fit for good men and angels to ride over without jar without noise and without fatigue to horse or man. So it was that when I came down with Lycidas to the chapel at seven o'clock, I found Harry had gathered there his eight pretty girls and his eight jolly boys, and had them practicing for the last time, Carol, Carol, Christians, Carol joyfully, Carol for the coming of Christ's nativity. I think the children had got inkling of what was coming, or perhaps Harry had hinted it to their mothers. Certainly they were warmly dressed, and when fifteen minutes afterwards Howland came round himself with a sleigh, he had put in as many rugs and bearskins as if he thought the children were to be taken new-born from their respective cradles. Great was the rejoicing as the bells of the horses rang beneath the chapel windows, and Harry did not get his last de capo for his last carol not much matter indeed for they were perfect enough in it before midnight lycidas and i tumbled in on the back seat each with a child in his lap to keep us warm i was flanked by sam perry and he by john rich both of the mercurial age and therefore good to do errands harry was in front somewhere flanked in likewise and the twelve other children lay in miscellaneously between like sardines when you have first opened the box. I had invited Lycidas, because, besides being my best friend, he is the best fellow in the world, and so deserves the best Christmas Eve can give him. Under the full moon, on the snow still white, with sixteen children at the happiest, and with the blessed memories of the best the world has ever had, there can be nothing better than two or three such hours. First, driver, out on Commonwealth Avenue. That will tone down the horses. Stop on the left after you have passed Fairfield Street. So we dashed up to the front of Halliburton's palace, where he was keeping his first Christmas tide, and the children, whom Harry had hushed down for a square or two, broke forth with good full voice under his strong lead in Shepherd of Tender Sheep, singing with all that unconscious pathos with which children do sing, and starting the tears in your eyes in the midst of your gladness. The instant the horses' bells stopped, their voices began. 
In an instant more we saw Halliburton and Anna run to the window and pull up the shades, and in a minute more faces at all the windows. And so the children sung through Clement's old hymn. Little did Clement think of bells and snow as he taught it in his Sunday school there in Alexandria. But perhaps today, as they pin up the laurels and the palm in the chapel at Alexandria, they are humming the words, not thinking of Clement more than he thought of us. As the children closed with, Swell the triumphant sound to Christ our King, Halliburton came running out and begged me to bring them in. But I told him no, as soon as I could hush their shouts of Merry Christmas, that we had a long journey before us, and must not alight by the way. And the children broke out with, Hail to the night, hail to the day, rather a favorite, quicker and more to the childish taste, perhaps, than the other, and with another Merry Christmas we were off again. Off the length of Commonwealth Avenue, to where it crosses the Brooklyn branch of the Mill Dam, dashing along with the gayest of the sleighing parties as we came back into town up chestnut street through louisburg square we ran the sleigh into a bank on the slope of pinckney street in front of walter's house and before they suspected there that any one had come the children were singing carol carol christians carol joyfully kisses flung from the window kisses flung back from the street Merry Christmas, again with a good will, and then one of the girls began, when Anna took the baby and pressed his lips to hers, and all of them fell in so cheerily. Oh, dear me, it is a scrap of old Ephraim the Syrian, if they did but know it. And when, after this, Harry would fain have driven on, because two carols at one house was the rule, how the little witches begged that they might sing just one song more there, because Mrs. Alexander had been so kind to them when she showed them about the German stitches. And then up the hill and over to the north end, and as far as we could get the horses up into Moon Court, that they might sing to the Italian image man who gave Lucy the boy and dog in plaster when she was sick in the spring. For the children had, you know, the choice of where they would go, and they select their best friends, and will be more apt to remember the Italian image man than Chrysostom himself, though Chrysostom should have made a few remarks to them seventeen times in the chapel. Then the Italian image man heard for the first time in his life, Now is the time of Christmas come, and Jesus and his babes abiding, and then we came up Hanover Street and stopped under Mr. Jerry's chapel, where they were dressing the walls with their evergreens, and gave them hail to the night, hail to the day. And so down State Street and stopped at the advertiser office, because when the boys gave their literary entertainment, Mr. Hale put in their advertisement for nothing. And up in the old attic there, the compositors were relieved to hear nor war nor battle sound, and the waiting world was still. Even the leading editor relaxed from his gravity, and the in-general man from his more serious views, and the daily the next morning wished everybody a Merry Christmas with even more unction, and resolved that in coming years it would have a supplement, large enough to contain all the good wishes. So away again to the houses of confectioners who had given the children candy, to Miss Simmons' house, because she had been so good to them in school, to the palaces of millionaires who had prayed for these children, with tears if the children only knew it, to Dr. Frothingham's in Summer Street, I remember, where we stopped because the Boston Association of Ministers met there, and out on Dover Street Bridge, that the poor chair-mender might hear our carols sung once more before he heard them better sung in another world where nothing needs mending. King of glory, King of peace, hear the song and see the star. Welcome be thou heavenly King, was not Christ our Saviour. And all the others, rung out with order or without order, breaking the hush directly as the horses' bells were stilled, 
thrown into the air with all the gladness of childhood, selected sometimes as Harry happened to think best for the hearers, but more often as the jubilant and uncontrolled enthusiasm of the children bade them break out in the most joyous, least studied, and purely lyrical of all. Oh, we went to twenty places that night, I suppose. We went to the grandest places in Boston, and we went to the meanest. Everywhere they wished us a Merry Christmas, and we them. Everywhere a little crowd gathered round us, and then we dashed away far enough to gather quite another crowd. And then back, perhaps, not sorry to double on our steps if need were, and leaving every crowd with a happy thought of the star, the manger, and the child. At nine we brought up at my house, D Street, three doors from the corner, and the children picked their very best for Polly and my six little girls to hear, and then for the first time we let them jump out and run in. Polly had some hot oysters for them, so that the frolic was crowned with a treat. There was a Christmas cake cut into sixteen pieces, which they took home to dream upon, and then hoods and muffs on again, and by ten o'clock, or a little after, we had all the girls and all the little ones at their homes. Four of the big boys, our two flankers and Harry's right and left-hand men, begged that they might stay till the last moment. They could walk back from the stable, and rather walk than not, indeed. To which we assented, having gained parental permission, as we left younger sisters in their respective homes. End of Story 2 Part 1